Um, all right, we're going to. Pardon? Do we have an opening for them next week? We have an opening here every week for them. Yes. Now that's not like we're proselytizing. No. But if y'all want to come on over here, you can. <laughs> I am just blessed that their church would uh, share them with us. We're going to release our children for Children's Church. Bind us together. They're bound together. <laughs> song just kept going through my mind. That little short song, I am blessed. I am blessed. Every day that I live, I am blessed. When I wake up in the morning, when I lay my head to rest, I am blessed. I am blessed. Y'all sing it with me. I am blessed. I am blessed. Every day that I live, I am blessed. When I wake up in the morning, when I lay my head to rest, I am blessed. I am blessed. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> well, I had to do considerable research. But I actually found something in the Bible to preach about. <laughs> it's amazing how often you can come up with something. <laughs> if you just read it. Praise God. Well, I'm going to read to you today out of 2 Peter. Second Peter. You know, God has blessed us with so many abilities. You saw some of it dis uh, displayed up here today. We are blessed to have our people who come every week and practice, rehearse, and come and sing and play. These are abilities that God has given. And we have willing people who are willing to come and share them. What a tragedy it would be if we had that talent and they refused to share it or ignored it, wouldn't it be? And then, of course, out of the abundance of God's blessings, He sends other people to us who are blessed with abilities. Yes. A lot of those abilities are readily seen. But so many of God's people possess varying abilities that they seldom if ever use. And the body of Christ goes lacking Yes. and wanting yes. because they either have this been told this lie or believe the lie that the talent that they have is insignificant that the abilities that they have there's no way that that could be used in the body of Christ and so the body goes lacking we all have a function. Yes. We all are a part of the, the overall body of Christ. 
If we do not use what God's given us, if we do not function in the body of Christ, then there the body is impaired. Uh, if you uh, if the eyes of the church refuse to look, then we wander. We just wander aimlessly. If the ears of the church refuse to hear, we walk into the path of danger. If the hands and the arms do not function, if the feet do not function, every piece of the body is crucial. Yes. If you can put it in the context of your physical body, which one of the functions in your body would you give up with willingly? Not a single one of them. Uh, as unseemly as it is, the armpit has a function. There you go. Somebody's got to be an arm. <laughs> Amen. Mm-hmm. Everybody has a function. And, uh, and an ability. God grants some of us multiple abilities. But all of us are gifted with some ability. You can find a place. You can find a function. You can find a need. And see it supplied by God's grace, by His ability. The, the thing that troubles me is that we waste so much ability, so much time, either declaring that we don't have the ability or refusing to use it. And that's what I want to talk to you today about. You probably already got an idea. I want to talk to you about unused abilities. Body of Christ is almost non-functional in comparison to what it can be and what it can do. So I want to start with the source of our ability, and it's in 2 Peter, the first chapter, and I'm going to read several verses. You can't just stop somewhere in the middle. 2 Peter 1, the first chapter, beginning in verse 3. It says, as His divine power has given to us, how many things? All things. All, wait a minute. All, yes. All All things, what kind of all things? All All things things. that pertain to life and godliness. How does it come? Through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. These are given to us so that we can become partakers of the divine nature of God. Now that's that's strong. strong. Divine nature having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Jesus said, I've given to each one of you a measure of faith. So you don't have to go looking for it. It's there. But He says, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. Listen, for if these things are yours and abound, they're not just a trickle, but they abound, you will neither you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren and sisters, I added that one. Be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you'll never stumble. I thank the Lord for His Word. Amen? Amen. Amen. It just struck me here, and I ask you to take notice. It says that He has granted unto us all things yes. that pertain to life and godliness. And the fact is, when we came into Jesus and He came into us, we have become partakers of His divine nature. Amen. There is the divine nature of God imparted into you. You say, well, I don't feel like I've got the divine nature. I don't care what you feel like. Let, all, let every man be a liar, yeah. a liar and God be the truth. If God said it's in you and you know you love Jesus, you've got the divine nature inside. Yes. Is Jesus living in you today? Yes. Then do you have the divine nature of God inside? Yes, yes you do. The answer is yes. Yes. Say it with me. Yes. Yes. That nature that he's talking about is eternal life. The divine nature of God is eternal life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life. And, and just a trickle of it. Oh, that's not what it said. No, not what said. I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly, overflowing, more than you need. He is always a more than enough God. He never gives you almost enough. It's always more. I've caused you to be ever triumphant. I've caused you to be more than conquerors. So God doesn't bring you a short supply so that you taste it and wish you had more. He gives it all to you. I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. That life that I'm talking about is the very substance and being of God Himself. Consider that. The creative ability that was manifested in creation has been planted in us. We have the authority with faith in our voices. We can speak and cause things to happen. Yes. Now I'm not talking about witchcraft and stuff. But the Word of God says if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Be thou removed and be cast into the sea. That's pretty strong. He said, I will create the fruit of your lips. What are you saying? What do you say? He says, I'll make it happen. We have that creative ability invested in us. And we also can experience Jesus' miracle-working authority and power. That's, right. yes. That's a part of what He has given us. Yes. I wonder what it, what it would really... Who knows? Who knows what it would mean if this power and glory that we're talking about were utilized by every one of us who received it. Amen. My, my, my. My goodness. Jesus said, I have come to restore that which was lost. Yes. That which was lost. That that they're talking about was His glory. Back in the Old Testament, how because of rebellion, He lifted Himself up how off the, the, uh, the mercy seat of God. And he lifted himself up and hovered over the, t the tabernacle, the temple. But because they refused to listen to him, 
eventually he just left them. Down through the years of the Old Testament, the prophets, they begin to prophesy that there's coming a day when he will return. There's coming a day when the glory will return. And one night in the fields of Boaz, while shepherds attended their flocks, the angel of the Lord came. He said, Come see. He is come. He has returned. His glory has returned. And we have it now. Invested in each one of us. He has come to restore that which was lost. So the question begs answering then. Why do we not utilize this authority and this power? Why do we live such lackluster <coughs> lives? Or, or how do you know what kind of... Well... I can tell you that I'm not seeing personally that glory and that authority manifested in the body of Christ. Amen. Now if you've got it cornered and it's really working for you, I wish you'd stand up. Yeah. Because uh, it might get contagious and come off on some of the rest of us. Amen. But I don't, so I'm, I'm not offended if I preach it myself and say, why am I not utilizing this authority in my life? Let me just go off to the side just a moment and tell you something that you already know. But the Lord said to, to Moses to have the people write these things over their doorpost and, and, and uh, on, on the, the, the lintels and on the doorpost so that every time they come by the door, they'll remember what I told you. And so I think it applies to us today. You may know some stuff, but... Can you stand to hear it again? Yes. Come on. Yes. Absolutely. So we are, I want to remind you that we are a triune being. Amen. We are a body, a soul, and a spirit. Rather, we are a spirit who has a soul and lives in a body. That puts it in the order that it should be. Now the body, of course, is ruled by the five senses. That's all it knows to do. The soul is the seat of the mind, the will, and the emotions. And then, of course, the spirit, that's the real person. That's the real man. That's the real woman. We are a spirit. We have a soul. And we live in a body. But we are a spirit, first and foremost. Did you know that there are also three kinds of people? There's the natural, I'm going to say man, but you know what I'm talking about. Men, women, creation. <coughs> There's the natural man. There's the carnal man. And then there's the spiritual man. Now, the natural man is the one who has never passed out of death into life. He has never received the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. He's never been recreated. In 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. Romans 8, 7 says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. And so, the natural man is a man or a woman who has never confronted Jesus and asked Him to remake them, to recreate them. The natural man, of course, he knows nothing else but to be ruled by his senses. It's really the source of everything he knows. Outside of that, since he has no spiritual insight, there is no other knowledge. That's all he has to go by. That's, what he was, that's how he was born. That's how he grew up. He has to make all of his judgments according to the five senses. 
And that's a dangerous place to be. But sense knowledge is all that the world has. Now I want to turn over to Ephesians right quick and read to you a graphic picture of this natural man. In Ephesians 2, verse 1, and it says, And you He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, <coughs> according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others were. A graphic picture of natural man. That's where we were, every one of us. If we've never given our lives to the Lord, that's where we still are. So there's the natural man. The carnal man is a, is a person who is a new creature in Christ. But he has never developed himself. He is, he is totally undeveloped in the things of the Lord. And it's possible that this carnal man may stay in that condition all of his life and never develop beyond being a baby. He's governed by his senses, by his own choice. The natural man can't help that. But the carnal man can. But he still chooses to be governed by his senses rather than by his spirit. Now he has the choice but he chooses to go the other way. In 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, verses 1 through 3, it says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, not with meat, for you were not yet able to bear it. Nay, not even now are you able. For you're not, for you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you jealousy and strife, are you not carnal? And do you not walk after the manner of men? How do you gauge whether you're still carnal? Is there strife among you? Is there jealousy? Is there this yay, 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 yay? Is there this little striving to get a leg up on somebody else? Is there, is there this? Are you deaf? Can you not hear what God is saying to you about these very basic things? I know people who have been in the Lord 30 years are still carrying on jealousy, backbiting, talking about people, gossiping. Oh, they do it under good cover. You know, they got the thing disguised real good. And if you talk to them about it, oh, well, I'm just concerned about the brother. No, you're not. You just you just talking about. It. You ain't interested in fixing nothing. You just wanna you just wanna settle your little deal. You want to get your little self feeling good. Oh, I told you. I got that one straight right there. I'm just glad I'm as holy as I am. Yeah. <laughs> Walking like worldly men and women. These people do not walk according to the law of love. There is a new law, you know. It's called the law of love. And we're supposed to walk according to it. And if we do, if we choose to walk in the law of love, we stop the jealousy. We stop the strife. We stop vaguely disguising the way we are. Covering it up so it seems relatable. 
we stop that and we get honest with ourselves. If we walk in the love of God, we cannot continue in strife and jealousy. Backbiting. Those are all saints. They're all signs of an undeveloped life in the Lord. They really are. And as long as we are selfish and sensitive and we get our feelings hurt, you are still carnal. You are still a baby in Christ. A Christian for 30 years and you still crawl around trying to get some pablum sucking on a pacifier, <laughs> wanting the pastor to come by and pat your little poor little head. <laughs> God bless you, you little rascal. You. I know you mean good. I know you said that and hurt half the people in the church. But you, that's okay. It, do we pass that? How long, Jesus said, how long will I put up with you bunch of rascals? <laughs> it's time to get past that. Amen? Amen. Amen? And then, of course, there's the real deal. There's the spiritual man. Yes. This man, this woman, is developed in divine things. The things of God. His spirit controls his intellect and his senses. When, the spirit, when your spirit is reborn... He's fighting an uphill battle because all your life you've gone by what you sensed and you've gone by what your body told you it wanted. And so the Spirit steps up this little bitty thing and He says, I'm not going to do that anymore. And the, and the flesh says, what are you talking about? I've had this this way all my life. I'm not going to think that way. What do you mean you ain't going to think that way? I've been thinking like this all my life. But as time goes by, that spirit begins to grow. Yes. And it will reach a place where it will reach up and slap right in the face the flesh and say, shut up. There you go. Mm -hmm. It will reach up and slap your senses and say, I don't care how much you want that. Shut up. Amen. I'm in charge here. Yes. That's the spirit man. God governs the spiritual man by His Word. God's Word. And a spiritual person is one who has drunk deeply, if you will, at the fountain. You've taken it in. You've fed regularly at the table of the Lord. You've taken this thing seriously. You've saturated yourself with the love of God. That's the spirit man. In 1 Corinthians 2.12 it says, but we receive not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is from God, that we might know the things that were freely given to us of God. God expects out of us that we become spiritual men and women. We have wasted for too long the precious anointing of God, yes. the precious abilities of God. Yes. You don't have the bit to brush your teeth except God gave you the ability. Yes. Much less the ability to preach, teach, share, love, play instruments, sing, dance before the Lord. You don't have any of that stuff except God gave it to you. It's all from Him. And we will never utilize the ability of God in us until we make the decision that we're not going to play around anymore. That we're not going to be spiritual immature babies anymore. That we are ready to go from pablum to stake. And, and, and I assure you, God will feed you stake. Amen. But you got to want it. I want to I wanna share something. In the book of Colossians, let me go over there. I want to read something to you just... It, it all just grabbed hold of you. In Colossians, the first chapter, beginning in verse 9. Colossians 1, verse 9. 
For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. And look at this now. And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might. My goodness. Yes. Strengthened with all might according to His glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Giving thanks to the Father, listen, who has qualified us to be what? Partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. It says in that, uh, in, in that ninth verse, to be filled with the knowledge. I want to go into that just a little bit. If we're going to be used in our talents and abilities used, we need to know just what we have been given. That's right. This word knowledge in the Greek is epinosis. Epinosis. It literally means, now listen to this. This is what you're supposed to be having. This is what you were given. Epinosis. Paul, do you know you got epinosis? Man, you don't. <laughs> you know, it, it's a good thing. It means perfect, exact, complete knowledge. It's not just some kind of well. I think that's what happened. He says that we are given epinosis, perfect, exact, complete knowledge. God gives it to us along with spiritual wisdom. Why? So that we can understand how to use all that's around us. All the elements around us. And use them to our advantage and to the kingdom's advantage. Verse 12 again. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. We have the ability to enjoy our share of the inheritance of the saints in life. How, how big is that? How strong is that? John 8, 12 speaks about the light of life. The Greek word is zoe. Z-O-E. It translates God's nature. God's nature. Now, follow me here. Since Jesus is light, and we have Him in us, are y'all with me? Since He is light, we have Him in us, we have this light of life, where? In us. In other words, we have God's ability to face the human needs and circumstances that surround us. We are not walking this walk in the flesh. We're not facing these difficulties every day on our own. We're not facing them with the little bit of ability or strength that we have. We are facing these things with God's ability inside of us. He has invested it in us so that when we are confronted with the circumstances that surround us that so often overwhelm us. And truth is they should not overwhelm us because we have God's ability inside of us to face them. Amen. It says in one of the Psalms, though, though we go through the fire, we will not be burned. Though the rivers overflow us, we shall not be, we shall not be drowned. 
It doesn't matter what the circumstances say, we know who we are and we know where we stand. It, the, the only problem is we know it up here, but we do not know it in our spirit. And when we get it in our spirit, and that, by the way, is one of the longest journeys in the world, from your head to your heart. When you get it in here, then we can sing the song, I shall not be, I shall not be moved, just like a tree planted by the water. I shall not be moved. Right now, Amy is walking through the fire. Yeah. And she's passing through the river, yeah. but it will not overflow her. Amen. Yeah. It matters not what comes our way. It only matters who we depend on, who we stand in. He says he will not suffer, he will not suffer us to be abandoned and to be harmed. But He'll be with us through it all. That's what we've got, saints. How can we utilize what God has given us? Colossians 1, 2, 12 says, Giving thanks unto the Father who has made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. He has given us. You don't have to go looking for He's given us the ability to enjoy our share of the inheritance. Y'all with me? Yes. Am I boring you? No. no. If I'm boring you, we'll stop and cast it out. There you go. Amen. Colossians 1.13 says, Who delivered me out of the authority of darkness and translated me into the kingdom of light. In other words, into the realm of revelation knowledge. We are in that realm of revelation knowledge. The revelation that God can give us to know epinosis, to know it and to walk in it. God is at work through our minds, operating through our spirits. If we will let Him, how can we utilize it? Just turn loose. Turn loose and let Him do it. He actually will take you over. How many of you are possessed today? Oh, wait a minute. Let me explain it a little bit. How many of you are possessed by Jesus? Amen. Well, you're possessed. There you go. <laughs> yeah, by the Holy Ghost, I'm possessed. Thank you, Lord. He is ruling over us. He is possessing us. It's not a bad thing to be so totally into Him that you are possessed by Jesus. The Holy Ghost has taken you over. I heard a lady preach from uh, Nigeria, missionary in Nigeria. Heard her preach Friday night. She talked about someone talking about did she have time for this or that? And uh, she said, I have no time for anything. But God. That's all I... If you want to talk about something else, I'm sorry. I am only talking about Jesus. And she's saying, I'm possessed. Amen. I'm totally caught up. Well, what happens to my life down here? I won't have time to do this or that. I guarantee you, you the, the, the guy that was witnessing to someone and he said, well, if, if, uh, if I give my life to Jesus, I won't get to do uh, this. I won't get to go to the casinos. I won't get to go. I won't get to do this. I won't get to do that. Uh, he said, no. He said, you, 
you come to Jesus, you can do anything you want to you. He said, is that right? He said, yeah. He said, the thing is, though, that God changes you want to. Yeah, that's Amen. right. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yeah, there was a trick to that one. <laughs> First Peter, yeah, amen. First Peter 2, 9 says, We are the chosen generation. A royal priesthood, a holy nation. We sing it, but do we believe it? We sing it, we talk about it, but do we act like it? We sing it on Sunday morning. But what do we do with it on Monday morning? When all hell breaks loose around us. All of a sudden we're whining and running for cover. You have the faith the size of a mustard seed. Say to that now. Get out of here. Be thou removed, be cast into the sea. Don't doubt in your heart. The mountain will move. The devil coming at you from every angle. James says, submit yourself to God. Then, resist the devil and he might listen to you. No, it says he will flee. It doesn't say he'll back off in the corner and wait for you to give up on it. He says he will flee from you. Submit yourself to God and He will flee. That's the authority. That's the power that we have in our lives. We are an elect people. We are a royal priesthood. A holy nation. We are set apart. You tell most Christians they are royalty and they'll look at you like you're You tell most Christians, did you know that I am righteous? They'll look at you and say, that's heretical. No. Righteous? Nobody righteous but God. Well, then God's a lie because He said, I am the righteousness and we are the righteousness of God. Now, who's the truth? Is it our religious opinion or is it the Word of God? I am, I have right standing with God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We are set apart for God's own possession. Why? Why? Here's the reason. Here's the reason God has done for you what He's done for you. Here's why He's invested in you what He's invested in you. And if you hadn't done it for this kind of reason, then there'd been no reason to leave you here. The moment you receive Jesus in your life, He could have just taken you on up. There's a reason why you're here. He's left you here for a reason. And here's the reason. So that we can unveil the hidden treasures of grace by God that is at work with inside of us. You go to a hopeless, helpless person and if you can open yourself up and unveil what is inside of you, that hidden treasure of the grace of God, and they can see it and feel it, they will no longer be hopeless or helpless. When you are able to unveil the loving grace of God, not some religious posture, not some looking down your nose at at someone because they're not as spiritual as you are. But just open yourself up and they are able to look inside of you and see something that they desperately want. That's the grace of God. Colossians 2, 3 says, In whom, all, in whom are all the treasures of wisdom and not hidden. Hidden. He has given us the light, saints. He has given us the ability to know what these treasures are. These are not mysteries anymore. These are not some 
thing that God's holding out, maybe right before He translates us into the kingdom, He has shown us a little bit of it. He has done this, and they are unveiled to those who will submit themselves to the Spirit of God. We can walk in a revelation of the wisdom and knowledge, the treasures of the wisdom and knowledge of God. We can know what they are. He's given us the ability, the epinosis, the knowledge, to know the knowledge of what He has done for us. How much do you know about what He has done for you? Well, He saved me. Yeah, that's a good thing. And uh, He's filled me with the Holy Ghost. That's good. He's healed me a few times. Uh, he's, he's shown me some things. Is that all you got? That's where most of us are. But He's given us the wisdom and knowledge to know what He has done. To know what He is to do inside of us. What He is to do with you. Is this it? Is this and Wednesday night? Is that it? Is what He's going to do with you inside this building? Maybe a little. But 99% of it is outside the walls of this building. And that's where you're going to find what He is to us and what He is in and what He has done inside of us. And He reveals them with wisdom and knowledge who we are. I dare say we really don't know who we are. Amen. And to know what we can do with the ability that God's given us. It's His ability. And then, of course, when you get all of that down, then there's the wisdom to utilize the knowledge. It's one thing to know it. It's another to have the wisdom to use it. But He said, I'll give you both of them. In Colossians 1.27, it says, To whom God was pleased to make known what is the riches of the glory of of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The riches of this sacred secret, hidden through all the ages, is now unveiled to us. And is now unveiled through us. We we hold the mystery of the ages. What is the mystery of the ages? Christ in you, the hope of glory. And he said, I've held it in secret all of these years, but now I have manifested to the world. Where? How? In the body of Christ. If we don't show it, then the, the unveiling of that mystery has gone by the wayside. It is And God, I tell you, the Lord has made no other provision for the world here. It's us or it's nobody. And if what they get is some distorted view of what God has done, some selfish, self-centered Christian who doesn't have enough grace or love to even tell somebody that Jesus loves them, we have seen it wasted. This precious hidden treasure. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Jesus unveils to us the ability of God that is in us. I'm not going to drag this out. I don't drag it. Very well, Thank you, Jesus. John 1, 3 says, All things were made through Him. Without Him was not anything made that's been made. In Him was life, and that life is the light of men. The life in Jesus is God's life. And that life is our light. It is our ability. It is our wisdom. It's God Himself 
becoming our personal tutor. It's God Himself becoming our personal tutor, leading us from strength to strength, from success to success, from failure into victory. It's God taking us over and building Himself into us until we can say with Paul, it is no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. But Christ who has taken me over. Wouldn't it be worth it? Wouldn't it be worth it? Wouldn't it be worthwhile to learn to utilize the Spirit that is within us? Wouldn't it mean much to us, to your family, to your lost ones? Wouldn't it mean much to the church if that life was so fired up inside of us that we could no longer stand the thought of coming into this building with two-thirds of it empty seats? Wouldn't it mean that to us? Would it stir us up that we can no longer live like we're living in our own little cocoon, caught up in our own selves? Wouldn't it mean that for our loved ones? If we made this, what I'm saying, if we made this a part of our lives and used it just like we were using simple mathematics, 2 plus 2 is 4. I have finally learned my tutums and gazentas. Yes. Two times two is four. Two gazenta is four. Two times. Yes. So if we can use it just like these simple mathematic formulas. Those, they say the mathematic formulas will work every time. If they do, how much more will the life of God and the knowledge and wisdom of God work every time for us. Yes. It will bring such a personal cleansing inside of us. First of all. First and foremost. I don't know that God is going to extend and put us out into the mission field when there's stuff in our lives that keep us from walking in the Spirit, even with our family members, even with those in the church and said, I really don't see God giving us all that wisdom and knowledge and, and extending it to us until we come to a place where we cleanse ourselves, where we repent first of the things that we hold on to, of our self-centered and selfishness. Yes. Give it all up. God is not going to pour pure oil in a nasty vessel. Right. He will not do that. He will not pour it in a cracked vessel. Can you imagine the precious anointing oil of God poured into a vessel that has a hairline crack in it Instead of the oil being poured out then on the, the heads of those who need it, it sits there and evaporates through the crack of use to no one, just a vapor out in the air. We need to come to that personal commitment of excellence in our lives. And then uh, see if God will not do His work. See if He will not open up the windows of heaven and give you revelation knowledge that you never knew existed. To be able to walk up to a person who is troubled inside and you say to them, how are you today? And they say, I'm, I'm fine. And, and you look at them and say, Spirit of God shows me that your wife or your husband that you're about to break up that you're troubled because your children are about to be lost. Or I'm feeling fine. The Lord shows me that there is a sickness in your body 
and you've been fighting it, and you've been wanting help, God shows me that it's there. And if you'll allow me to pray for you, it'll be gone. And that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. So you don't wander through this life day after day, meeting hundreds and hundreds of people who are crying out for help, and you don't have the sensitivity to even know it. We're missing our opportunity. We are missing our chance. Unused abilities. I'm not talking about I can do this or I can do that. I'm a pretty good carpenter. I can, I, you know, I can get up and speed. I'm just talking about this stuff. Now God gave you those abilities, but that's natural ability. I'm talking about the nature of God coming up out of you that will show you show you supernatural things that will change the life, your life, but change the lives of those around you. Yes. How would you feel today or tomorrow? And you're wandering along, you're just going along, thank you Jesus for the day. You pass somebody and God says, I want you to stop telling me something. And, and everything in you freezes. <laughs> but you do it. And what God told you to tell them breaks their heart and just just melts away hardness and brings them into a new place in their life. How would you feel about that? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? It's there for us. God may have you right this close to hearing Him prophetically or give you a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge and you're able to deliver it under the authority of the Holy Ghost and you change people's lives these saints are the unused abilities and the body of Christ is hurting struggling and dying because we do not know how to do anything about it. Well, that's, that's the good news. <laughs> it is good news because it's the gospel. Amen? Amen. The good news is there's an answer. There is an answer. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, I pray to God that you have heard something that you can use today. And that God will cause it to not just just go by the way and an hour from now I can, could hear you saying we had a great time this morning. The great word and somebody asked you what it was and you say, I don't remember but I know it was good. <laughs> but that this thing goes into your heart. These are things that will live in you. If that doesn't happen, we've wasted our time. I believe it's going to happen. Amen. Father, we thank You, Lord, for the Word of God. We thank You, Lord, for the authority of it. We thank You, Lord, that we can look to You and see You dip into our lives and create something great in us. That the abilities that You have could become active in our lives. Not just our little earthly abilities, but the abilities of God, the anointings of God, knowledge and wisdom. Father, fill us up. Lead us to the altar of repentance. And then, Lord, saturate us with you. That we can become the instrument in the hand of a living God in this last day. Not waste away, pine away until you come and lift us out of here. Help us, Almighty God. Bless us with your glory in 